According to Wikipedia, typology in Christian theology and in biblical exegesis is a doctrine or theory concerning the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Typology is very useful for grasping truths about the Catholic faith because it is both at the same time simple and profound. Through typology, people, places, and events from the Old Testament are seen as a foreshadowing or a prefigurement of people, places, and events in the New Testament. Typology uses storytelling to deepen our understanding about the Catholic faith. And this is much like the approach that our Lord took to explaining truth, as he spoke in parables and in stories so that everyone could understand. Please listen prayerfully and open your hearts to see the typological prefigurements that lie waiting for us in the Old Testament. Before we examine how the spoliation of the Papal States was prefigured in the Old Testament by the Babylonian exile, I would like to offer an idea. The Old Testament contains the entire history of the Israelites. The Israelites were the Old Testament people of God. Their entire history, from their inception until their ending, is completely contained in the books of the Old Testament. Similarly, the New Testament is the entire history of the new people of God, the Catholic Church. The New Testament really contains our entire history from start to finish. However, the difference is that for the Israelites, their history is entirely recorded in the Bible. Our history is still being lived out. We are still in the New Testament even though our history is not recorded entirely in the Bible. With that concept in mind, it becomes clear why the spoliation of the Papal States would be prefigured in the pages of the Old Testament. If the Old prefigures the New, then events in the history of the Church would be prefigured by the Old Testament. It's not just people, places, and events from the pages of the books of the New Testament, but the actual history of our church that comprises the actual New Testament. Now we are ready to look at how the spoliation of the Papal States is prefigured in the Old Testament by the events surrounding the Babylonian captivity. The story of the events leading up to the Babylonian exile in the Old Testament are somewhat complex. However, the weakening, the weakening of the twelve tribes and their subsequent captivity by the Assyrians and Babylonians can be traced back to the rebellion of the ten tribes under the leadership of Jeroboam. After the ten northern tribes of Israel revolted, both the northern tribes and the southern tribes made unusual and profane alliances with neighboring pagan empires in order to secure themselves. Most notably, the kingdom of Judah under King Ahaz made an alliance with the Assyrian Empire. Immediately upon his ascension, Ahaz had to meet a coalition formed by northern Israel under Pekah and, and Damascus under Rezin. These kings wished to compel him to join them in opposing the Assyrians, who were arming a force against the northern kingdom under Tiglath-Pileser III. To protect himself, Ahaz called in the aid of the Assyrians. This appeal to Assyria met with stern opposition from the prophet Isaiah who counseled Ahaz to rely upon the Lord and not upon outside aid. Over time, the northern tribes were taken captive by the Assyrians. The Assyrian Empire was eventually weakened by a coalition of foreign powers, which included the Babylonian Empire, 
the next great empire. Babylon would come to dominate and conquer almost the entire region. The Neo-Assyrian Empire is usually considered to have begun with the ascension of Adad-Nirari II in 911 BC, lasting until the fall of Nineveh at the hands of the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, the Mede-Persians, the Scythians, and the Sumerians in 612 BC. Babylon eventually escaped Assyrian rule, and in an alliance with Sexarces, king of the Medes and Persians, together with the Scythians and Sumerians, the Assyrian Empire was finally destroyed between 612 BC and 605 BC. Babylon thus became the capital of the Neo-Babylonian, sometimes and possibly erroneously called Chaldean, Empire. During the period of time when there was a vacuum of power and neither Assyria nor Babylon was dominant, the good king of Judah, Josiah, died in a battle against Pharaoh Necho II, the Battle of the Valley of Megiddo. Josiah's son, Jehoahaz, was made king. He was soon deposed by Pharaoh Necho and brought to Egypt as a captive where he died. Pharaoh then put Jehoahaz's brother, Jehoiakim, on the throne of Judah and made Israel pay tribute to Egypt. However, soon the city of Jerusalem came under siege by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. In order to stop this siege, Jehoiakim changed alliances and he started paying tribute to Nebuchadnezzar. But when Nebuchadnezzar failed to conquer and invade Egypt, Jehoiakim changed alliances again back to Egypt. This angered Nebuchadnezzar, who sent rovers to lay siege to Jerusalem. Jehoiakim was killed, and Jeconiah was, was made king in, of Judah in his place. From the second book of Kings, chapter 23, verses 29 to 34. In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. The king Josiah went to meet him, and he was slain at Megiddo when he had seen him. And his servants carried him dead from Megiddo, and they brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in Iris, his own sepulchre. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and they anointed him and made him king in his father's stead. Jehoahaz was three and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned only three months in Jerusalem. The name of his mother was Amatol, the daughter of Jeremiah of Labna. And he did evil before the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. And Pharaoh Necho bound him at Rablah, which is in the land of Emoth, that he should not reign in Jerusalem. And he set a fine upon the land of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah his father. And he turned his name to Jehoiakim. And he took Jehoahaz away, carried him to Egypt, and he died there. And then the second book of Kings, chapter 24, verses 1 to 2. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years, and again he rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him the rovers of the Chaldees, and the rovers of Syria, and the rovers of Moab, and the rovers of the children of Ammon. And he sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants the prophets. The second book of Kings, chapter 24, verses 5 to 6. But the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the words of the days of the kings of Judah? And Jehoiakim slept with his fathers, 
and Jeconiah his son reigned in his stead. Jeconiah reigned only three months, until he was taken captive and prisoner, along with a large part of Judah, by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar installed Zedekiah as king over Judah. However, Zedekiah eventually rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. This was the final straw for Nebuchadnezzar, who came and besieged Jerusalem. He destroyed the walls, destroyed the temple, and took more of Judah as captives into the land of Babylon. In ending the reign of Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar put an end to the reign of the Davidic kingdom. The second book of Kings, chapter 24, verse 15. And he carried away Jeconiah into Babylon, and the, and the king's mother, and the king's wives, and his eunuchs, and the judges of the land, he carried into ha- captivity from Jerusalem into Babylon. And he appointed Matthias, his uncle in his stead, and he called him Zedekiah. Zedekiah was one and twenty-three years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. The name of his mother was Amatol, the daughter of Jeremiah of Labna. And he did evil before the Lord, according to all that Je- Jehoiakim had done. For the Lord was angry against Jerusalem and against Judah, till he cast them out from his face, and Zedekiah revolted from the king of Babylon. And from the second book of Kings, chapter 25, verses 1 through 5. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army against Jerusalem, and they surrounded it, and they raised works round about it. And the city was shut up and besieged till the eleventh year of Zedekiah. The ninth day of the month, and a famine prevailed in the city, and there was no bread for the people of the land. And a breach was made into the city, and all of the men of war fled in the night between the two walls by the king's garden. And Zedekiah fled by the way that leadeth to the plains of the wilderness. And the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king, and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. And finally, it's well worth noting that the Ark of the Covenant made its final appearance in the Old Testament during this period. Before the Babylonians came to besiege Jerusalem and destroy the temple and lead the Jews into captivity, the prophet Jeremiah was present in Jerusalem and he was weeping over its upcoming destruction. Jeremiah prophesied that the temple and Jerusalem would be destroyed. His message was ridiculed and suppressed. However, Jeremiah did take the Ark of the Covenant and he hid it in a cave in order to protect it from the Babylonians. This story is is recalled in the second book of Maccabees. From the second book of Maccabees, chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, it was also contained in the same writing how the prophet being warned by God commanded that the tabernacle and the ark should accompany him till he came forth to the mountain where Moses went up and he saw the inheritance of God. And when Jeremiah came thither, he found a hollow cave and he carried it thither, the tabernacle and the ark and the altar of incense and he so stopped the door. Then some of them that followed him came up to mark the place but they could not find it. And when Jeremiah perceived it, he blamed them, saying, This place shall be unknown until God gather together the congregation of the people and receives them to mercy. Now that we have the events in place, 
leading up to and surrounding the Babylonian exile. We are ready to move on to the events leading up to and surrounding the spoliation of the Papal States. The events leading up to the spoliation of the Papal States are complex, just as the events that led up to the Babylonian exile are also complex. However, this complexity is compounded by the double occurrence of the confiscation of the Papal States in the 19th century. The Papal States were taken once by Napoleon and the French at the beginning of the 1800s, and the Popes were taken prisoners. The Papal States were restored after the defeat of Napoleon, only to be taken again in the latter part of the 19th century, and again the Popes were referred to as prisoners and captives. Despite the complexity of Europe leading up to the 19th century, the disunity of Europe and its turning against the Catholic Church can be best understood by tracing the events of Europe back to the Protestant Revolt. After the Protestant Revolt, great unrest gripped Europe. Strange and unholy alliances were made in Europe in order to gain security and balance of power. Most notable among these unholy alliances was the long-lasting Franco-Ottoman alliance that started right after the Protestant Revolt. The Franco-Ottoman Alliance, also called the Franco-Turkish Alliance, was an alliance established in 1536 between the King of France, Francis I, and the Turkish Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Suleiman the Magnificent. The alliance has been called the first non-ideological diplomatic alliance of its kind between a Christian and non-Christian empire. It caused a scandal in the Christian world and was designated as an impious alliance, or the sacrilegious union of the lily and the crescent. Nevertheless, it endured since it served the interests of both parties. The strategic and sometimes tactical alliance was one of the most important foreign alliances of France and lasted for more than two and a half centuries until the Napoleonic campaign in Egypt and Ottoman territory in 798 through 1801. A future video on the way the Ottoman Empire was prefigured by the Assyrian Empire will explore the parallels between the Franco-Ottoman alliance and the alliance between the Assyrians and Judah under King Ahaz. By the beginning of the 1800s, the Ottoman Empire was in a state of stagnation and decay, and it was no longer a threat to Europe. However, a new threat arose in Europe from within. The French Revolution caused the whole European continent great concern. The newly formed French Republic began to war with the Holy Roman Empire, primarily in the territory of Austria. Napoleon rose through the ranks of the French Revolution, and he took control of the government. He was to become the great conqueror of Europe, and an almost unstoppable force. Napoleon Bonaparte was a French military and political leader who rose to prominence during the French Revolution, and he led several successive, successful campaigns during the Revolutionary Wars. As Napoleon I, he was Emperor of the French from 1804 until 1814, and then again in 1815. Napoleon dominated Europe and global affairs for more than a decade while leading France against a series of coalitions in Napoleonic Wars. He won most of these wars and the vast majority of his battles, building a large empire that ruled over continental Europe before its final collapse in 1815. One of the greatest commanders in history, his wars and campaigns are studied at military schools worldwide. He also remains one of the most celebrated and controversial political figures in human history. A future video will explore the amazing parallels between Napoleon and Nebuchadnezzar, Napoleon's relationship with Pope Pius VII, 
his attempt to force his to force his will on the Catholic Church, his exile in Elba, and even his wife Josephine's opulent and extensive garden of exotic plants are all prefigured in the Old Testament by the events and people surrounding King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The Papal States suffered many setbacks at the hands of the French, both under the Revolution and under Napoleon. Through a series of invasions, the French took control of the Papal States. Pope Pius VI was commanded to renounce his temporal power, and he refused. He was taken prisoner and he died in exile. His predecessor, Pope Pius VII, was also taken prisoner by Napoleon, and the remainder of the Papal States were confiscated. The French Revolution proved as disastrous for the temporal territories of the papacy as it was for the Roman Church in general. In 1791, the Comtat of Venassin and Avignon were annexed by the French. Later, with the French invasion of Italy in 1796, the Legations, the Papal States' northern territories, were seized and became part of the Cisalpine Republic. Two years later, the Papal States as a whole were invaded by French forces, who declared a Roman Republic. Pope Pius VI fled to Siena, and he died in exile in Valence, France, in 1799. The Papal States were restored in June of 1800, and Pope Pius VII took up residency once again. But the French, under Napoleon, again invaded in 1808, and this time, the remainder of the states of the church were annexed to France, forming the departments of Tibur and Trasimene. In 1796, French Republican troops under the command of Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Italy and defeated the papal troops. The French occupied Ancona and Loreto. Pope Pius VI sued for peace, which was granted at Talentino on the 19th of February, 1797. But on the 28th of December, 1797, in a riot blamed by papal forces on some Italian and French revolutionists, the popular brigadier, General Mathurin Lernard Dufault, who had gone to Rome with Joseph Bonaparte as part of the French embassy, was killed and a new pretext was furnished for invasion. General Berthier marched to Rome, entered it unopposed on February 10, 1798, and proclaiming a Roman Republic, demanded of the Pope the renunciation of his temporal authority. Upon his refusal, he was taken prisoner, and on the 20th of February was escorted from the Vatican to Siena, and thence to the Corteza near Florence. The French declaration of war against Tuscany led to his removal by way of Parma, Pacienza, Turin, and Grenoble to the city of Valens, the chief town of Drome, where he died six weeks after his arrival on the 29th of August, 1799, having then reigned longer than any pope. And finally, here is the Wikipedia account of Pope Pius VII and how he was taken captive also by Napoleon. The narrative of Pope Pius VII and Napoleon is a very rich and extensive story. It will be covered in more detail in the upcoming video about Napoleon. France occupied and annexed the Papal States in 1809 and took Pius VII as their prisoner exiling him to Savona. Despite this, the Pope continued to refer to Napoleon as my dear son, but added that he was a somewhat stubborn son, but a son still. And one last note about Napoleon would be useful. Napoleon ended the Holy Roman Empire, which reigned in Europe since Charlemagne in the, 17, in the 700s. The last Holy Roman Emperor, Francis II, 
was deposed by Napoleon in 1806. Eventually, Napoleon was defeated by the powers of Europe. However, the ideology that the French Revolution and Napoleon instilled spread across Europe. With the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire, the old political system in Europe was finally made obsolete. After Napoleon's defeat, there was an attempt to return to the old political order, but the age of nationalism and revolution was sweeping across Europe. It was this movement that stirred the Risorgimento, which sought to unify Italy into one country. In 1870, Italian troops besieged the city of Rome, and they knocked down part of their Aurelian wall with cannon shot. Italian troops went through the breach and they captured the city of Rome, ending the Pope's rule of the Papal States. The First Vatican Council was occurring during the time of the spoliation of the Papal States in 1870. The Council stopped after the taking of the Papal States, and it was never reconvened. The First Vatican Council proclaimed the primacy of the Pope and the doctrine of Papal infallibility. Italian nationalism had been stoked during the Napoleonic period, but dashed by the settlement of the Congress of Vienna in 1814 and 15, which sought to restore the pre-Napoleonic conditions. In 1860, with much of the region already in rebellion against papal rule, Sardinia Piedmont conquered the eastern two-thirds of the Papal States and cemented its hold on the south. Italy declared war on September 10, 1870, and the Italian army, commanded by General Raphael Cardona, crossed the frontier of the Papal territory on September 11, and he advanced slowly toward Rome. The Italian army reached the Aurelian Walls on September 19, and placed Rome under a state of siege. Although the Pope's tiny army was incapable of defending the city, Pius IX ordered it to be put up at more than a token resistance to emphasize that Italy was ac acquiring Rome by force and not by consent. This incidentally served the purposes of the Italian state and gave rise to the myth of the breach of Porta Pia, in reality a tame affair involving a cannonade at close range that demolished a 1,600-year-old wall in poor repair. Pope Pius IX ordered the commander of the papal forces to limit the defense of the city in order to avoid bloodshed. The city was captured on September 20, 1807. Rome and what was left of the papal states were annexed to the Kingdom of Italy as a result of plebiscite the following October. This marked the definitive end of the Papal States. Following the spoliation of the Papal States in 1860 and 1870, the Popes referred to themselves as prisoners in the Vatican. They were without any land whatsoever and lost complete control over the city of Rome. It wouldn't be until 1929 that the Church would be given the, the, the city-state of Vatican City. For the amazing parallels between the Lateran Treaty and King Cyrus granting the Jews return to the city of Jerusalem, click on this link. And finally, it is worth noting that Our Lady appeared twice prior to 1860 in two major apparitions. Our Lady of La Salette appeared in 1846, and she wept the whole time she appeared. Her message was suppressed in France, and it gave many sad predictions for the Church and the world. And also, Our Lady of Lourdes appeared in 1858 in France. Our Lady of Lourdes appeared just two years prior to the first confiscation of the Papal States in 1860 by the, by the Italian government. Our Lady of Lourdes appeared in a cave. Eventually, a separate video will be made to show the parallels between the weeping prophet, Jeremiah, and the weeping Lady of La Salette.
And another video will be made showing the amazing parallels between Our Lady of Lords appearing in a cave, and then Jeremiah in the Old Testament hiding the Ark in a cave. Both occur right before the period of invasion and captivity for God's people. Now that we have finally recounted the events leading up to the Babylonian exile, and also the events of the 1800s, which saw the end of the Papal States, we can see how the spoliation of the Papal States was prefigured by the Babylonian captivity. During the period following the rebellion of the ten northern tribes of Israel, both the north and the south sought to make alliances with foreign powers to help sh to ensure their security against their fellow Israelite enemies. Judah made an unholy alliance with the Assyrian Empire. Isaiah the prophet was very much opposed to such an alliance. During the period following the Protestant Revolt, both the Holy Roman Empire and its enemies sought to make alliances with foreign powers. The Catholic country of France formed an alliance with the Ottoman Turks. This alliance was looked on as a disgrace since the Ottomans were responsible for the death and cruel treatment of such a vast amount of Christians. the Assyrian Empire eventually declined. The next power to rise was Babylon, who was led by the great conqueror Nebuchadnezzar. It was Nebuchadnezzar that subdued all the kings and empires in the land around Israel. It was Nebuchadnezzar who exiled the kings of Judah and took away the temporal power of the Jews. The Ottoman Empire that threatened Europe also eventually declined. However, Europe was now threatened by secular powers that were growing from within Europe. Napoleon rose to power and in a short time he conquered almost all of Europe. He captured two popes and he took away the church's temporal power. King Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem and deposed Jeconiah, the king of Judah. He carried Jeconiah away and brought him to Babylon. Jeconiah would never re re return again to Jerusalem. Napoleon invaded Rome and captured Pope Pius VI. He was taken away as a prisoner. He was never to return again to Rome, and he died in exile. After Jeconiah was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, his uncle Zedekiah was put on the throne. Zedekiah eventually rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, who responded by, by besieging Jerusalem and taking Zedekiah as a captive, and he was brought to Babylon. After Pope Pius VI was taken captive by Napoleon and died in exile, Pope Pius VII ascended to the papal throne. However, some years later, Pope Pius VII refused to capitulate to Napoleon. Pope Pius VII was captured and taken prisoner into Napoleon's custody. When Nebuchadnezzar invaded and conquered Judah, that ended the sovereignty of Judah as an independent nation. Although they would be later granted autonomy under King Cyrus, they were still a vassal state of the Persian Empire and owed their allegiance to Persia. Zedekiah, who was the last king of Judah, 
rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, who responded by ending the temporal power of Zedekiah. When the Papal States were taken in 1870 by the Italian government, that ended Church's sovereignty over its own land. The Church would be granted autonomy later on with the Lateran Treaty. However, as part of the Lateran Treaty, bishops had to swear allegiance to the Italian state before taking their diocese. Pope Pius IX was the last pope to reign over the Papal States. He called the First Vatican Council, which proclaimed the primacy of the Pope and Papal infallibility. The Council had to be stopped because the Kingdom of Italy took the Papal States away from the Church. The Davidic Kingdom started with its founder, King David. His descendants reigned from Judah in an unbroken line until the last Judean king, Zedekiah, was deposed by Nebuchadnezzar. Never again would a Judean king rule from Jerusalem. The Holy Roman Empire started with its founder, Charlemagne. His descendants reigned and protected the Catholic Church in an unbroken line until the last Holy Roman Emperor, Francis II, was deposed by Napoleon. Never again would there be a Holy Roman Emperor. During the Siege of Jerusalem in 587 BC, Nebuchadnezzar breached the walls and his troops poured through the breach to take the city of Jerusalem by force. During the Siege of Rome on September 20, 1870, the Italian troops breached the Aurelian walls near Porta Pia. Their troops entered through the breach and took the remaining Papal States of Rome by force. Just prior to the invasion of Babylon and the destruction of the temple, the prophet Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant in a cave to protect it from invaders. Just prior to the first round of papal state invasions in 1860, Our Lady of Lourdes appeared in France in 1858. Our Lady of Lourdes appeared in a cave. 